Nobody knows about this little town. Saludos. Saludos a toda la raza en jarretaderas. Cuy, cuy. You feel like everything slows down. You forget about everything in the world. The only thing that matters is getting the win, getting your hand raised, getting that double check, and going home and celebrate with the family. And at that moment, when they sent me back, I was so close. I was already in the United States. Were you by yourself or with family? I was by myself. Yeah, I was by myself. What's good, y'all? Your boy Brandon back again. Another episode of the Honor Up Podcast, man. This week in the studio, we have a very special guest. This is the first time we've had a fighter on set. We got one of the top featherweights in the PFL right now, man. 9 and 0. Brian Zercher in the building, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go. Yeah, appreciate you. Appreciate you for giving us your time, bro. No, brother. Uh, thank you for having me. It's really a honor to be your first uh fighter. And nothing. Let's let's get it going and uh, let's have fun. Yeah, for sure. So just to let the people know, you were supposed to have a fight just this past week. Unfortunately, it got canceled. We were excited to see you go, but um, yeah, we were just talking before the cameras were rolling about how difficult it is when a fight gets canceled because you've not only invested all the time and stress into energy into training, but also like the financial investment. So can you talk a little bit about what that's like when fights get canceled? Yeah, you know, it was very uh, unfortunate. I always seen it, but this is actually the first time that happens to me. I always seen a lot of fighters going through hard camps and uh, and getting close to the fight, it gets canceled. This was the first time that it happened to me. And man, it's not fun. Like you said, uh, we go, we were talking about training camps and stuff. We usually need at least six to eight weeks to get ready for a fight. I was on my seventh week getting ready for this fight. Everything was going good. Uh, I had been on a diet, which is the hardest part. Yeah, for I sure. I you guys being on a diet for six to eight weeks. It sucks. Uh, it was bad, man. I was ready for this fight. I was looking forward to fight this guy. And a week before the fight, I, I, I injured my, my back. And so we had to pull out the fight and... We had spent a lot of money. I had been on a diet. I had uh, I had bought flying uh, tickets for my coaches and everything. Everything was ready, and we had to pull out. And that's the game. That's the play. That's it. That's the game we play. And nothing. We just getting ready for the next fight, trying to heal up right now and uh, get another fight soon. For sure. Can you share what the injury is, or we're not sharing? Uh, it's nothing major. It was just, uh, I was doing my last sparring. Mm -hmm. I was doing some boxing sparring. I was on the 10th round, the very last one, my last sparring of the training camp, and then I got punched in the lower back. It was just a muscle. It was nothing crazy, but uh, I went to see a doctor, and he was like, man, if uh, there's no way you can fight. You need at least two, three weeks to heal up. It's nothing crazy, but if you keep going, it's going to get bad. So you shouldn't fight. Just rest. It's been two weeks. I feel good now. I've been running. I've been uh, stretching. I've been doing a lot of things. And hopefully next week I'm I'm back to training full time. That's the worst, no? Because if it's a big injury, you can understand. You're like, okay, I have to stay. But it's like, ah, it's two weeks. Like, should I go for it? Should I not? Dude, Is that, did you think about just dude, being like, I was trying, go for it? I was trying to hide it so bad. Yeah. And then my coach Hector was asking me, hey, how do you feel? I was like, man, and then in my head, I was like, what do I say? I, I wanted to say I was 100% and I, I was feeling good, and I did. He was like, do you want to take the fight? I was like, 100%, yeah, I mean, I'm ready for the fight. He's like, but when I saw you right now, you were limping. And I was like, no, I'm good. He's like, okay, we're going to go train right now, and if I see you, if I see you make a face or anything, I'm going to have to pull out the fight. Dude, I try to hide it. And now uh, I was training, and now my back was it was it was fucked up. Yeah. It's like yeah. when you eat something spicy and you try not to react, and it's just too much. Yeah, <laughs> just shows right in your face. But like you said, I was so mad because it was it was it wasn't a broken bone, nothing like that. It was something that it was just a muscle that was swollen and hurting. And I was like, man, it's crazy. But like we said, everything happens for a reason. I was supposed to fight a uh, a guy one guy and then they said the day i got hurt that's when they told me i wasn't gonna be fighting that guy he had some visa issues and so that fight wasn't gonna happen 
And then I went, I went to train waiting for a new opponent. And when I was waiting for the new opponent, that's when I got hurt. Yeah. And then they sent me a new opponent and I was like, there's no way I'm going to tell these guys I just got hurt. That happened on a Monday and I waited like five days. I was like, I'm going to be good. I was taking medication and going, uh, doing cold plunge and getting in the sauna, getting massages and everything. It just, I didn't, I didn't heal. Everything happens for a reason. Yeah, there you go. We, but how often are, because I, I imagine you're sparring hard, you're training hard, you're pushing your body to the limit. How often is a fighter really 100% when it's fight day? Or is there always like something? There is always something. Yeah. Yeah, if you have one guy telling you that he's 100% going into a fight, he's probably lying to you. There is always, like I was telling you, we spar three, four times a week during fight camp. And like I said, a fight camp is in between six to eight weeks. There is always something going on. You never go 100% to a fight. I don't remember the last time I went 100% to a fight. Uh, sometimes there is major things. Sometimes there is little things. But it's very. it happens very often that fighters go into a fight uh, with something hurting or injured. But like, like I said, if it's something that is not required to pull out the fight, you don't want to do it because right, you already course. invested a lot of time and money. And it's not only you. All the people behind the scene, all your coaches and, and training partners and everything. So you you want to make it happen as much as you can. For sure. And how did you get started? I've watched a few of your interviews, did uh, the research, did our due diligence. Uh -huh. But um, can you tell us the story? I guess we have a little bit more time to, to talk about it. How did you actually get started into training? Like start fighting? uh that was back in mexico uh for the people that don't know i was i was born and raised in mexico i came to the states uh in 2014 10 years ago so the way i started uh training i was like every other mexican kid i wanted to be a uh, professional soccer player where was your team uh las chivas las chivas yeah <laughs> I was born in Guadalajara. Don't, don't dislike. Don't dislike the video. No, yeah, you know, that's the best team. Las Chivas. All the America fans are going to be salty. Nah, nah, ooh. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> Puro Chivas. Yeah, so I wanted to be a professional soccer player. But, man, so I used to play on a, on a club with all my cousins and my friends and everybody. And everybody was good but me. And I was chubby when I was like uh 12 13 i was already like almost 200 pounds so i was i was a little fat so you were always the goalie yeah no no not even <laughs> they wouldn't let me play oh, nah, that's <laughs> bro up. the only the only way they would let me play it was if like they were winning i don't know five to one like, i right, put brian yeah in. They'll let me they, play. Can't, they can't For they pain. can't come yeah. back dude <laughs> they'll let me play the last five minutes only if they were winning, I don't know, four to one, five to one, that there was no way I can fuck that up and, and lose, you know? <laughs> Man, and I always I used to be on the bench, like what the fuck? I used to I used to tell my dad, hey, I'm playing Saturday, come see me. My dad used to go to the games and son, are you gonna play today? <laughs> and I was like, I hope. And uh I now decided that I didn't play. And so one of my friends, he had been training uh, Muay Thai for like two, three years. And uh, just talking with him, I was like, man, I want to do something that I don't have to depend on other people and, and I can just give my max and, and try to be good, you know? And he was like, hey, you should come try a class with me. And uh, so I went and I liked it. I, I fell in love with the sport. And uh, so I have an uncle. He was my, my trainer. Cesar Mego Palomera, he was a world champion and I was already 12 years old, but I, I didn't know him. I always, my family always spoke about him, but I had never met him. And so I was like, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it. So I did my first class and he had an academy. So, and then I went to his, uh, his uh, academy, his uh, school. I started training and he was like, man, I think you can be good. So he was like, do you want to fight? Oh, I was like, that's not, that wasn't my plan, but it sounds fun. Right. And so he got me a fight 
and within like I think it was about four or five months into training, so I had my first Muay Thai fight. Did you I, win? Yeah, I had to lose a lot of weight. Yeah. So in like four or five months, I lost a lot of weight, and I won. I won, and uh, I became a little bit a little bit more popular, and you know, I lost weight. I felt confident, and it was cool. So well, how like, old were man, you? Fourteen. I was. 15 15 yeah around that age it's like if you have to be the best fighter or the best at soccer that's how you become the yeah popular. that's how you become yeah. popular i was like and definitely i'm not gonna be the best one in soccer <laughs> so i gotta do something else yeah and that's how that's how i started with the uh, martial arts and did you fall in love with it right away i'm guessing after you train so hard and then you actually see that you won and not only did you win but you know when you play soccer the team wins you're like oh yeah we yeah. won but when you went by yourself, you're like, I did this by myself. Is that what really made you fall in love with the sport? Yeah, some of that. Yeah. It, yeah, it was a great feeling just being in there. But I think, you know, the adrenaline got me. It's something that you're never going to get on a soccer game or basketball game or a football game. I think fighting is very special and different. The feeling that you get, and especially... That as I started with my right foot, you know, I won my first fight. That was that was a feeling of man, I can I can yeah, this is this is something that I wanna experience again and again and again. And this is only a, a fight in front of fifty people. I cannot imagine how it feels fighting in a big arena in front of twenty thousand people, you know? And something one of the main things that got me into fighting it was, I'm telling you, my uncle, he was already a world champion. And one of the things that stuck to me is that he was traveling around the world and getting paid for fight. I was like, man, this is something that, that sounds cool, you know? So like fighting not around. only can I kick people's asses, but I can see the world and I get paid for it. <laughs> Dude, getting paid for punching people in the face and being on TV and being all cool. And yeah, that's, that's kind of what got me into the sport. Yeah. And what does that feel like? Because you said a little bit, you touched on it a little bit. You said the adrenaline. So to me, it's like you can watch soccer, you know, when it's 1 1, 90 second minute. It's like, okay, like everything's That's tense, 19, right? Bro. Or football, you know, it's the last, you know, quarter of the fucking Super Bowl. Your, your team is down, like you have to score. Basketball, like last second shot. But in fighting, the whole fight, in any instant, it can be that moment because either you can knock the other guy out, he can knock you out, you're getting choked out. Like it, happens like that so what is that adrenaline like being like in the cage i mean there is nothing that I, that i have experienced close to that you know like you said anything can happen at any given second so you gotta be you have to be aware of everything everything in the cage you have to forget about everything else in the world you have to just be is you and that guy and your corner that's all that matters but like i said there is nothing that can compare to to what to what I feel when I'm in there. You feel like everything slows down, you forget about everything in the world. The only thing that matters is getting the win, getting your hand raised, getting that double check, and going home and celebrate with the family. That's that's all that matters. The adrenaline. I love that. Yeah. I wouldn't change it for anything. I love doing that. How hard is it to hear your coach when you have all these people just yelling in the arena? Actually, you know, it's not it's not that hard. Sometimes, uh, yeah, of course, it's going to be very loud, people screaming and, and also trying to coach you. But when someone goes in your corner, it's people that you already have a, a, a big connection with them, you know? So... With the person that you have in your corner, you have to trust them 100% because it's everything happens so fast that whatever they tell you, you cannot think about it twice. You got to just do it. So we drill for that too, you know, when uh, when we're getting ready for fights, we go, we get in the cage, I'll get one of my uh, sparring partners and we'll do three, four, five rounds in the cage and I have my corner. Sometimes we have music and stuff like that, trying to simulate and... Like I said, when I go into the cage, I forget about everything else. And the only thing that I try to do is listen to my corner. Yeah, you said it in one of your post-fight interviews. You said, like, um, 
it's like a video game. They're controlling me. I'm just inside the cage doing what they tell me. I think you said something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, when I go in my fights, that's, that's how it feels. These guys are giving me directions. And like I said, whoever is in your corner, you have to trust those people. So every time I go into the cage and I'm fighting, they just give me orders. And that's, that's the first thing I do. You as a fighter, you have to trust your instinct. To, instinct. Sometimes they're gonna they're gonna tell you to go right, but if you see to the left is an opening, you also have to trust your instincts. But most of the times, whatever they they tell me to do, that's what I do, and it feels like like a video game. Yeah, in some of your recent fights, the opening's been to the left, right? Always that <laughs> left hook with the left hook, uppercut, left hook, right? Both. Yeah. Yeah, so the one last year, yeah, we went, but it was things that we saw before the fight. Those those two combinations, they gave me those combinations. They usually they're the ones that uh, study the fights. They just give me. I like watching fights once or twice to whatever I see, but and then my coaches, my corner, they're the ones that study and they tell me, okay, so this guy we're gonna go. This is what we're gonna do. And that's what we drill throughout the camp. That's what we're doing. And that one with the uppercut left hook, my uncle was like, bro, we're gonna get this guy like this. He kicks, but he never he's never setting up the kicks with hands or anything. So you can you're gonna get him with the upper and the hook. And it was like that. And this last one, hey, how good it was, that knockout. Put his lights out, folded him like a fucking chair, bro. <laughs> Like Crazy. a fucking wet noodle. Yeah. Laundry. Yeah. He just, <laughs> yeah. It, it, the one before that, same thing. Yeah. Right before that, right? And what was crazy about the fight before was when I saw it, I thought you hit the upper and he was already out. It hit him in the chest. Yeah. It didn't even hit him on the face and it just on the, right on the job. The yeah. Hook, yeah. Put him out. And he's like, no, no, I was okay. No, you weren't, buddy. Yeah, bro. My yeah. left hook is money. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Hey. But I wish you, it would have been in the UFC. That would have been 50K, baby. Mm, 50K. Yeah. yeah. But soon. 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 It's gonna yeah, y'all could punch me for like 10K. You know, I don't need that much. <laughs> I'm just saying, man. But you got to win to make that 50K. Or lose. I don't care. Just, just 10K. Fight of the night. Yeah. Dude, yeah. But what if you lose all your teeth and broken nose and everything? It's You're going to spend 10K more than 10K to, make to no, fucking fix no, that listen, shit. Listen, punch me for the 10K, then I'm going straight to go, go get the veneers. That's easy <laughs> money. Yeah. Uh, but one thing that I love is like a typical Mexican, you know, anytime we have some kind of event, we have like 20 family members at whatever event is. You travel deep. Anytime you have a fight, your mom is there, your tias are there, like everybody in your family is there. So you've always had that support. And you spoke about it in an interview that there was a point in your time, a point in your life where your mom had to come to the U.S. and you were in Mexico by yourself. She was sending you back money. And that really, like, I identify with that because I had something similar in my life. And those, to me, are the stories that I love to tell because they really make you understand whoever it is, whether it's an artist, a fighter, an entrepreneur, it tells you who they are as a person, right? Because we can all look at the left, uh, the, the left hook knockouts all night, and those are amazing. But this is what really makes you you. So can you share a little bit of that story with us? Yeah, you know, that's something that has been kind of like personal and I haven't shared much about it and not many people knows about it. They all know uh, I came from Mexico and and I came because I wanted to fight this and that, but they don't know how hard it was for me to come to the States, you know? Uh, like you said, like, you know, uh, my mom, she came to the States when I was three or four years old. So I stayed with my grandma over there. My mom came and the plan was to, uh, she was gonna come and then a few months later, she was gonna bring me with her. And uh, for one thing or another, legal, legal stuff, you know, uh, I couldn't come. So we wanted to do it the right way. So I went and tried to get my visa and I got denied three times in a row. It didn't work. And then the lights and, and the scenario was like, man, I'm never going to be able to go the, to the States legally. So when I was 10 years old, uh, I tried to come to the States. I was 10 years old and uh, illegally. And I got caught. They sent me back Sent to Mexico. Back. 
yeah, it was it was hard, you know. Um, but like we said in the beginning of the podcast, everything happens for a reason. Eventually, when when I tried to come, uh, I wasn't in the sports. I didn't know martial arts. I was I was chubby. I told you I was fat. I was eating a lot, and I was just being a kid. But and then they sent me back to Mex. They sent me back to Mexico. So I went back to living with my grandma, my second mom, and th and then I got I got I got into martial arts. I got to know the sport. I started training, and then I became a resident. I got my green card when I was sixteen, and then that's when I came to the states legally. I had I had met martial arts. I was already into the sport. So if you go back from being from three years old to like 16, that's when I was able to come. When my mom came, we thought it was going to be only a few months that I wasn't going to be with her. So it's been, it's, it was hard, you know. And at that moment when they sent me back, I was so close. I was already in the United States and they sent me back. And uh, so at that time, we didn't understand why. Fuck, I was already in the United States. So you did cross? Yeah. Where 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 were you? California? Arizona? California. California. Yeah. Were you Cal with family at the time? When you huh? were you by yourself or with family? I was by myself. Yeah, I was by myself. Uh it's a long story and I was ten years old. I don't I don't really remember everything hundred percent. And but yeah, now we look back and uh I went back to Mexico. I met I met martial arts. And then now I'm a I'm a United States citizen, you know. So now we understand that everything happens for a reason. It was hard, but uh, it taught me a lot in life, you know. You're not you're not allowed to give up, and everything happens for a reason. Now we're here, and now I'm sharing with you guys this that I never shared with anybody, you know. Not with any, not in the cameras. Yeah. How difficult was it? to rebuild the connection with your mom like did you have trouble with that at all not at all it was because i'm telling you you mentioned already you saw my past interviews my mom she was always present she was always there since the day she left she was calling me every single day every single day every weekend she was sending money every month every two months she was sending big bags full of clothes and mm -hmm. and video games and everything so when we saw each other, it was it felt it felt natural, you know. I was a kid, and I'm her her only son. It wasn't it wasn't that hard to like uh, build that connection, because she was always she was always there. She was always doing homework with me. She it felt like she never left, mm. you know. It was it wasn't it wasn't hard to build that connection. That's good, and you guys are super close now, right? Yeah, right now she's, I can say she's my best friend, you know. Uh, we we like traveling. That's that's the biggest connection we have. We like traveling. We've been to Europe. We've been, we've been to a lot of different uh, countries in Europe. And here in the States, we've been to so many different states. There's, there's times that she's like, hey, do you want to go, for example, do you want to go to Washington this weekend? And we just catch a fly and we go to Washington and then we're in Washington and we were supposed to be there for three days and we did already everything we wanted to do in the first day. And then she's like, hey, we have two more days. We can go to uh, Canada. We can go to uh, Vancouver. It's three hours driving. Let's get a car. And then, yeah, we have we have a good time together. We go to concerts. We watch TV. We're very close. That's good. And I think it 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 shines in the way like you work. Because you have a very strong work ethic. Like we were talking about this, just how much dedication you put into. Because it's not easy, right? The dieting, the training, the the whole day, um, the sacrifice it takes. But you have something like I, I I identify a lot with that because like we grew up the same. Like we, I feel like a lot of people have the same story where we see our parents just sacrifice, right? Because it can't be easy for your mom to say, "I have to leave my three year old son and go to the United States and work and do this." I know it's not easy, but it gives us like motivation to be like, if they can do that big sacrifice, I can put in two more hours of sparring. I can sit in the sauna for a little while longer. I can cut the weight, right? 
Dude, that's that's actually what really gets me through training camps and and tough days, you know. And just like you said, when I'm tired and I do one or two trainings and I know I have to do another one and I'm feeling tired, dude, even to this day, like even today, my mom, she left home uh, like at eight in the morning and she came back like seven right before I came here. She had just coming back home from work. So it's really hard to not push to the limits when she's she's been doing this for 20 years since the day when i was three years old and she came she's been doing the same thing every single day just working hard and uh yeah looking for a better future for her and uh especially for us you know for me i'm her only son and i know this last 20 years uh she's been putting in the work man and i want to change that soon and I know it's going to happen, you know. That's why I work so hard. And the work ethic, man, I'm nev I'm not going to stop until I make it happen. Until she can be uh, free. Uh, what is it called? Financially free. Financially free, you know. Whenever I want, I want her to be able to say, okay, today I'm not going to have to work 10 hours. I'm going to work five, but because I want to, not because I have to. And she's been sacrificing. She's been doing everything for me. And I'm going to, it's going to pay back. And the only thing that, that I can do is just give everything, you know, everything into what I do. Nothing is warranty. It's not warranty that I'm going to make it and I'm going to be, you know, millionaire. And, but I just want to, I just want to be able to say I gave it all and I did it for her Absolutely. to, to pay her back. It's going to happen. Yeah, it's, it's going to happen, happen. And one day we're going to look back at this interview and be like, man, he was our first fighter on the podcast. Yeah, he now, he's, dead, yeah. Yeah. now he's got $10 million. He don't yeah. even know who we are anymore. Yeah. <laughs> nah, 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 we're going to we're gonna be kicking it together. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to be having more talks like this. I would love that. I would love that. Like, I've seen, um, there's, a, there's a podcast I really like. It's called Flagrant. I don't, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. But, um. They had uh, Israel Adesanya, like, when he was just coming up. I think he had just gotten into the UFC, maybe one or two fights in. And they, they became, like, close friends. So now he does that podcast, like, all the time. And now obviously we saw he became um, champion of the world, you know, Fuck. be Alex Pereira. So it's like, I, I remember watching that first episode, and then I had no idea he was going to become that. And then seeing him get to where he got to. I love stories like that. Like that's what I love is just finding people who are like really good people and just seeing them grow and achieve their dreams and succeed. Like to me, those are the stories that I love telling. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna blow shit up, man. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna mark mark my words. I'm gonna in PFL there has never been a uh, Mexican champion. Yep. I'm gonna be the first Mexican champion in PFL. And yeah, we're gonna we're gonna make history. We're gonna make a lot of money, and show people that everything is possible. Sir, yes, sir. And hire your new strength and conditioning coach. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Before uh, starting the podcast, we were. I was telling them that I need a a strength and conditioning coach. Yeah. And the openings. AKA punching bag. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian, I had a question for you. So besides your mother, and I know this is very important to you but what else motivates you is just keep on fighting to keep on going to where you're at right now. yeah so my main thing is my my mom but also i want people to i want to open doors for for mexican kids hispanic kids but mexicans in 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 a specific you know because i come from very humble beginnings you know from a little town in uh near puerto vallarta nobody knows about this little town and saludos saludos a toda la raza en jarretaderas cuy, cuy. <laughs> yeah but uh something that really motivates me is uh keep opening doors for the kids that are coming behind me you know uh where i'm from there is a lot of kids training they see me on tv they see me doing interviews and they all want an opportunity like this so my one of my main motivations is 
trying to bring those those cameras and those opportunities to these kids. And I want to have my legacy, you know. I want to make history. I want when people talk about Mexican MMA, I wanted to bring up my name, you know. I was the first Mexican to become a champion in PFL. And that's that's motivation to me, you know. And you train at a Randy Couture's gym here in Vegas, right? I train at a few different different gyms here in Las Vegas. So my my MMA, my MMA sparring, I do it at uh, Extreme Couture, Randy Couture. That's where I do my MMA sparring, my wrestling. Uh, we have a lot of uh, champions and contenders and a lot of guys coming up, you know, some of the best fighters in the world. And then my jiu-jitsu, I do it at uh, Cobrinha with Hector Vasquez. Yep. He's my jiu-jitsu coach and also my head coach in MMA. And just uh, recently, I started training boxing with Capetillo. A lot of people know Capetillo. He trains yeah. Brandon Moreno. A lot of good fighters train in his gym. He went viral not too long ago. Yeah, you saw that he video? he had them hands. Yeah, he, he has got, those he got hands. them hands and kicks too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not down. bad for a boxing, boxing coach throwing yeah. kicks yeah. when he was with uh, Masvidal. So that's where I do my boxing. And I'm always traveling in Las Vegas from Extreme Couture to Cobrinas to do Jiu Jitsu, to do boxing. That's my main three gyms. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because Randy Couture, like I I, I remember when UFC first started getting popular, um, my dad would watch it. And we were always, we're Mexican, right? We watch soccer, we watch boxing. But y y MMA was something different at that time. And I remember sometimes like he would just be watching. I'm like, what are you watching? And he would be like, who do you think is going to win? The guy in the black trunks or the guy in the white trunks? I'm like, I don't give a fuck, Dad. Like, why are you asking <laughs> you? But uh, Randy Couture was one of those fighters that I remember, one of the first fighters I remember watching in that era, like watching him fight um, like Chuck Liddell. Like that fight to me, I was like, what the fuck is yeah. going on? And did he, who were some of your earliest MMA inspirations? When I got into MMA, uh, the spider... Anderson, Anderson Silva, Silva was oh yeah. my goodness yeah he was he was the, the best fighter uh also two Brazilians him and uh Jose Aldo he was one of my biggest inspirations Chama and, and yeah Chama <laughs> Brazilians huh? shout out to Brazilians <laughs> and they also come from very humble beginnings you know they come from the favelas and stuff like that uh when I saw them fight I started doing my research and you can see they come from the favelas. They don't have a lot of things over there too. They probably have it even worse than us. So I was like, man, if these if these guys are doing it right now, there is we can do it too. But uh, definitely, I was looking up to those guys. Yeah, Anderson Silva was a beast back then. Like I remember all his fights were just so entertaining to watch. Like what he would do, how he would be in the ring. Like he was the first one I remember that had like that like showmanship. About yeah, him. he was so precise. He was crazy. He was fighting with uh, his hands down and stuff like that. And he wasn't even that, that strong. His punches weren't that, that, that hard, but he was so precise. And yep. he just needed one punch. And yeah, he, he made the sport very popular until Conor McGregor came and he blew it up, you know. Yeah. Everybody started knowing about uh, martial arts. But you know, fun fact about uh, Randy Couture, he's the oldest UFC champion. Yeah, I remember watching him and like, I was like, dude, that guy looks old, like his hairline <laughs> receding and shit. <laughs> but he was actually old. Like, I think he started, I don't wanna, I don't wanna give the wrong number. I think he was 38 or something like that when he started. When he started doing UFC. MMA. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, what the fuck? And you see this dude wrestling, like taking people down, like, bullying people like yeah. before khabib started the whole wrestling trend that's now he was bullying chuck liddell he was bullying like everybody and he he had power too yeah like, he was trading with like chuck liddell at the time i, I say chuck liddell like because that was the guy i remember he had the mohawk mm -hmm. he was putting people to sleep the ice man the yeah. ice man yeah he was a badass bro i hope i hope one day we can interview him but um yeah randy gets in, in the cage with him he's trading with him and he's he's like hurting him i'm yeah. like what is going on so yeah, he's definitely, and then he was the first uh, two division champion. Yeah, what was it? Uh, two hundred five, and then he went up to light heavyweight. heavyweight. Yeah, light heavyweight and heavyweight. Yeah, I think heavyweight first, then light heavyweight, which is crazy. So yeah, damn, that's crazy. 
and he was he was older bro when he became champion i think he was already like 44 45 yep fighting uh yeah i don't know 33 year old 35 year old but that's when the sport uh was you know when you had one guy that was very good at something but there wasn't really good mma fighters like you complete know? fighters yeah complete yeah. fighters yeah. well-rounded fighters mm -hmm. he he had really good hands in greg roman wrestling, wrestling yep but yeah to be a good fighter i think those are really good base starting points you know wrestling and boxing and that's what he had and yeah he was very successful with that he was very good with the uh, wrestling and then a lot of these guys that are good with the wrestling they fall in love with the power they have and then they forget about wrestling and then they just want to knock people out yeah randy was one of those if you were to like start fighting from scratch let's say you find someone on the street who's like i know nothing i don't know how to throw a punch i don't I know like how to wrestle this on that age thing. like yeah. that's what i want to add yeah. on like uh because how old are you now i'm 28. okay but you've been uh you've been doing mma since like yeah. like, like fighting since, some kind of like, since a youngin like if yeah. i started today how long do you think it would take for me to like at least not die in the ring. Oh no! One, one a better question I think would be like, what things should you focus on? Yeah. Like, should it be boxing? Should it be wrestling? Should it be jujitsu? Should it, like what? What would you say? Recommend him to do? Yeah, I'll say wrestling. Wrestling. Yeah, wrestling. You can take someone down and just lay on top of them and just kill the time. You know, because yeah. What about I, like street fight though? A street fight. Yeah. Uh, it could be. I I always want to say jujitsu, but. If you grab someone's neck, your hands are busy, you know, and someone yeah. came from stop you. Yeah, someone yeah. can come from the back and fucking stab you or something. <laughs> Illegal weapons, street weapons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, he said yeah. a street fight. Yeah. Yeah. He said yeah. a street, yeah. street yeah. fight. Yeah. yeah. Someone can come and hit you in the head with a bottle or yeah, something, yeah. you know. Anything. So I'll say boxing. Boxing. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think I I think Canelo has a better chance of surviving in the streets than than someone that is really good at uh, wrestling because this guy has to bend down and take you down and yeah. Canelo can be just bam, 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 you know? Just put people to sleep. But yeah. like, what are those like intangibles that like make a good fighter? Like you need what, like good hand-eye coordination, like be quick on your feet. Like what are those things that like a, a good MMA fighter needs to have to really have Man, like, a successful career? No, you need all of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be at the highest level, you gotta be. You have to be fast. You have to have good eyes. You have to. Your reaction has to be there. And to be a good, good uh, MMA fighter, you have to be good uh, at many different uh, disciplines, many different martial arts. You cannot. It's not like uh, twenty-five years ago that the yeah, greatest. People just pull guard. Just sit on the ground yeah. and pull guard, <laughs> like bro. Yeah, yeah. it's not gonna no, happen. Not anymore. anymore. No. no. Now all the good fighters, all the top fighters, are good at everything. You know, and little little details are what make makes the difference with those fighters. But like to be elite level right now, you have to good, you have to be good at everything. But like, how did you know you were like like how long did it take you for to go like okay, I think I got something here. Um, when I started training at Extreme Couture, you know, uh, before that I was an amateur fighter, and I knew I always I always knew I had the balls, you know, to be a good fighter. Yeah. But balls is not is not That's all not you enough. need. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I started training at Extreme Couture, and so I started training with all these high level guys. Uh, a lot of a lot of guys that are ranked in the UFC. I was still an amateur, and uh, so they were asking me to do rounds with them, and I was doing really good, and I was winning some of those rounds when I was an amateur, and these guys had already 15, 20 professional fights, and I was doing really good. I was like, man, uh, I feel, I know if, if I take it serious and I do everything that these guys are doing, I can be good, because at that time, I was still an amateur four years ago. I only been a professional for like three years. And at that time I was going to school. I was going to CSN. I was working at the link as a valet parking and I was training. And I was like, okay, so plan A is fighting. That's what I like the most. Yeah. But if it doesn't work, 
I'm gonna, I was going to CSN. I wanted to be a firefighter. I was taking some classes over there. So I was like, if A doesn't work, I'm gonna go to B. Yeah. And if B doesn't work, I'll keep working at the link. <laughs> I have insurance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was in the union. But, and then I went to this place and I was like, man, if right now I'm going to school and I'm working and I'm training not even full time, if I do it full time, I feel like I can, I can be good and I can compete without those guys. That's when I said, okay, I'm gonna leave school and I'm gonna stop working. I'm gonna go from being full time, I'm gonna only do two days a week. And I'm gonna go full time with the uh, fighting. And I turned pro. And three years later, now we're here. Nine and no in three years. Nine and, and another no. thing to, to, to talk about is you, it's either knockout, submission, or majority decision. There's been like no room to say like, oh, maybe it could have gone another way. That was too close. Yeah, no, there's like there's no 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 room for anything. Yeah, man. When I go when I go into a fight, you know, people goes to the show and they pay a ticket, and what they want to see is they want to see violence. They want to see entertainment. Someone get knocked out. Yeah. Someone get knocked out, you know, or shocked out. And so I like. Pleasing the people, you know, they go pay for something and that's what I that's what I wanna provide. I wanna provide entertainment. So I always try to finish my fights. I like you said, I never been in a boring fight. I always give my all and yeah, the numbers numbers don't speak, lie. Speak yeah. for themselves. <laughs> numbers they, don't lie. They ask and you give them the left hook. But that that's was, all you need. That was one of my questions too. Like, what makes? Because I know you said that in um, one of your previous <clears> interviews, you were like, "The last thing that people can expect from you is a boring fight." What makes a boring fight though? What makes a boring fight? And what makes your fights not boring? Man, my my fights are never boring because I'm always going forward, looking for finishes. And then there's other fighters that they go in there, and all they think about is. Winning the fight don't matter, doesn't matter how, you know. They can hug you for five minutes, 15 uh, minutes, control, the whole fight, yeah. and, and they won the fight, you know. And I respect that too, because at the end of the day, the priority is winning the fight. But for some fighters, for me, it's going in there and giving the people what they want. Of course, I want to win. I prepare myself for every single scenario possible in the fight that's why i do my wrestling i do my jiu-jitsu i'm always well prepared but i'm always going forward uh taking the risk trying to finish fights and i feel like that's rewarded a lot especially more in mma than other sports like for example boxing became this thing where if you don't have an o then it's like you, you you're not going to get paid anymore or something like that but the the good thing about mma is that we don't care about that. Yeah. If you're entertaining, I'd rather pay for entertaining fighter who's like 10 and 6 yeah. than a fighter who's like 13 and 0. But he, it's just like you said, he's just wrestling, just trying to get points and backing away, running away the whole fight. I'm like, I don't want to watch that. Yeah. 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 That's a good thing about MMA. Now we see a lot of champions with three, four, five, six, six losses in their records. You know, uh, you can you can lose a fight and then go on a six, seven winning streak and then fight for the title and become the champion. And like you said, in boxing, unfortunately, names like Floyd Mayweather, that's what they did, you know? Uh, if you have one loss in your record, you're trash. Yeah, yeah. And it's not like that, man. There is so many good fighters with one or two losses, and they don't get the same opportunities as, as, as other guys because they had lost one fight already. And now I think that's changing because that's what we do in MMA. The best fight the best. Yep. And that's that's the way it should be. And I feel like in the past years, a lot of people stop watching boxing because they notice the people is not not stupid, you know. And you can lie to the people. People stop watching fights, boxing fights because the the best wasn't fighting the best. The best yeah. was fighting whoever they wanted to fight because they were it's the A EBCW, side. Yeah. 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 It was just maintaining that. Just title. keep building yeah. record and, mm -hmm. and say I'm the best, but you're not fighting the best. Yeah. And the other thing I love about MMA is you have more of these like trilogy fights or, you know, four fights. In boxing, you don't see that as much anymore. Like growing up, I remember we used to have those like like uh, one of the biggest is like Pacquiao Marquez 
four fights and in the last one he uh, finally got the really knockout i'm yeah. like man that was such a good like looking back at it is like i love watching those fights and you don't see those anymore yeah now it's just oh i beat you once and it was by split decision but we're not fighting again because it wasn't a close fight it's like yeah. come on yeah. yeah even though it was a split decision yeah exactly yeah so it doesn't make sense but in mma yeah, we see it. We see it all the time. Brandon Moreno. Yeah, exactly. He had to fight Figueredo how oh, many yeah. times? That was one of the yeah classic, classic. And there fights. is so many like that. But uh, that's why I love MMA. You know, you you can't lie in MMA. Either you are the best or you're not, or you belong to the top, and Ooh. and you can't lie. You always and that's a good thing. You know, these companies. They make you fight the best because that's what people wants to see. Of course. And and uh, it's crazy how MMA keeps evolving and, and getting better. Now, all the guys are good, man. Everyone's good. Yeah. If you want to be one of the elite fighters, you have to be 100% in this. And little things are the ones that make the difference. And yeah, I love this. In your opinion, like at the moment, excluding yourself, because there's gonna be bias, who's like the goat of MMA, the greatest of all time? Right now, man, I think John Jones. Jones. Still, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if you wanna count Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think Jones, even though he's older now. Jones. I mean, also, um, Ilet Puri is really good. Ah, oh, he's a beast. Even though we haven't seen him fight a lot, he's he's there definitely. And I don't know if you agree with me, uh, Islam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great fighter. But Tapuria is interesting because um, I watched the uh, Volkanovski when he fought Yair, and that hurt me as a Mexican because I'm like, man, our boy went out bad. But then Topuria just the way he made it look with the made it look the exact same way. Like, yeah, because crazy. Volkanovski, he had been at the top for many years, and he looked untouchable. Yeah. He beat how many times Max Holloway, who makes everybody look like exactly. kids, you yeah. know? And then he goes and does that to Max Holloway three times, and then to Yair, and then Tupuria comes and does, does that to, to him. him. Yeah. You're like, man, this guy is on another level. Yeah. But you know, styles make fights. And we need to see Tupuria fighting more guys in different styles, and then he can be in the talk for the GOAT, you know? He needs to fight more guys. I think at this point, uh, Islam Makachev, he has way more fights in the UFC. He's fought so many good fighters, and I think he's above him in the in the GOAT list. Yeah. But... Uh, I think if he keeps doing these two guys, he's gonna, he's definitely gonna be in the gold list. For sure. And when you're in a fight, I, I was thinking about this like right before coming here, but um, I, I, I've spent a lot of time like trying to get better at interviewing people, like asking questions. And everywhere I look, it's like, okay, part of it is preparation, and then the other part is just like, go. Right, because I can come up with a list to ask you, but if I just stick to the list, it's a boring interview yeah. because we don't it's go a job anywhere. Interview. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Is MMA the same? Like, I I assume like it, it's different depending on like if you're a beginner or if you've had like a lot of rounds of experience. But is it the same in that you prepare, you study film, you you're like, okay, this is the game plan. But once you get in the in the ring, like or in the cage. It's just different because you're like, oh, like this is not what we were expecting. Like, how often do you have to improvise? <sighs> Almost all the time. Yeah. Yeah, you can go into a fight and you had been studying and working for something. And uh, uh, most of my fights, that happened. You know, we, there's a fight that I'm never going to forget. And uh, I don't know if, if you have seen my fight against. Uh, Scotty Stockman. Mm -hmm. It was my first fight in uh, PFL. I was a big underdog. They took me to PFL because they needed a fighter. I was just to fill up the spot. But uh, so we saw we saw a lot of film for this guy. It was it was the the opportunity that I had been waiting for. You know, I was only two and zero, and at two and zero, you don't really get those opportunities to be on a on a big stage, being on PFL with only two fights. 
So we did a we did a lot of work. We studied this guy. Uh we knew he was a wrestler. He was like three times state champion in Oregon. And uh most of his fights he he grappled. He did a lot of wrestling, taking down and keeping in the ground. So for six weeks, we're working, man. Wrestling. We're working, wrestling, wrestling, defense, not offense. Yeah, take defense. Down defense. Yeah. Uh, takedown defense and this and that. And we're going to keep the fight standing. I'm going to stop the takedowns and we're going to keep it standing. I'm going to box and I'm going to kick what I do. I go in the first round. Bro, this guy rocked the shit out of me, bro. The first two punches, bam, bam. He was also golden gloves. So he had like like 90 yeah. boxing amateur fights and like three professional yeah. fights. Something that we didn't know. We found out in the fight, and then I did my research after, and I saw that. But uh, my corner, they start screaming at me, Hector. He's like, go for the takedown. Go for the takedown. We need to change the strategy. And I was like, man, I, I, kept, it, I kept it standing in the first round. Yeah. And then I go to the corner, and he's like, bro, you need to fucking wrestle this guy. You need to, you need to take him down. And I was like, but that's not what we work on. Yeah. That's not what we work on. And he's like, just, just go. And he told me, this is what makes fighters, this is what make, this is what makes good fighters. Being able to improvise and, and change strategy in the middle, in the middle of the fight. And that's something that really stuck to me in my head, you know? So that was the first fight, but definitely not the last one. We always have to like go as, as, as the fight is going, you know? And you can you can see the tendencies of the fighters and that's something that you need to work on and be aware but you cannot rely on that 100 percent me that's something that i like you know you see me you you can see my last fight but and then when i have when i don't have a fight i'm a gym rat i'm always in the gym trying to learn new things that's when you have the time to keep adding tools to the toolbox because my opponent is going to go based of what Your he saw fight. in my last fight. Of course. And my job as a good fighter and being at the high level, my job is going into my next fight with a new arsenal. Different tools, different strategy. Because, like I said, he, he watched film and, and he thinks I'm going to do that. And they all think for this fight, they all thought, uh, we kept working and, and, and we said, okay, they're going to expect the left hook again. So we've been working on, on little things. And yeah, you can you cannot rely on, on what you see. And you have to improve as the fight goes. Yeah. And it's a lot harder for me, in my opinion, in MMA because you don't have as much time. Mm -hmm. And also there's so many different things that can come your way. Like one of my favorite uh, fighters to watch is Tank Davis, right? Because uh. he's just like... He gets in the ring and everybody's like, oh, you know, whoever he's fighting does okay for the first two, three, four rounds. Yeah. They're like, oh, this is it. He's going to lose. <laughs> and then six, seven <laughs> rounds comes. No. Yeah. Yeah. Turn the light yeah. switch gets yeah. turned off because he's in there just learning. Like, okay, where's he's the making opening? The yeah. Canelo does a lot of the same things. He starts off a little bit slow, but I can see why in boxing it happens because you have 12 rounds, right? You can maybe, if you're an elite fighter at that level, you can give away three, four rounds and be like, I'll still get the knockout or I can Come win back up. by decision, yeah. But in MMA, you have three or five rounds and that is not enough time. Not only that, but in boxing, it's just, you know, maybe just what what punches are coming, combinations, um, if they're coming at you or maybe finding like, to try to counterattack, but in MMA there's so many different things, right? Somebody could be a striker, they could be a wrestler, it could be jujitsu, they could try to fight so many different ways. Like it's much more difficult to improvise. Would you say? Yeah, it is. Yeah, like I said, <laughs> you cannot give rounds, you know. In MMA you only have three rounds. Usually three rounds, you know, when you fight for a belt, yeah. uh you have five rounds, but yeah, you you cannot give give out rounds. So you study patterns and, and, and what they do, but as you go in the fight, yeah, you have to, well, for me, like I said, I'm always looking for the finish. Uh, I try to make reads uh, the first minute, 30 seconds, 
and from there we see what what type of energy they bring in into the fight and we go from there yeah um i never been on a five round fight but uh i'm very excited and looking forward to that i know it's gonna have to be a little bit different but not much not much for me i'm gonna go and do and do the same thing what i do yeah and What's, go from there how how different does a gas tank have to be between like three to five rounds like it's i said i never double. been yeah i never been in a five round fight but in the in the gym i'm always doing five six seven rounds and uh one of my main weapons is my cardio i do a lot of cardio i love running and then with capetillo coach capetillo we do a lot of uh mountain running so we go to mount charleston on um uh, on saturdays we do six seven miles over there at high elevation so cardio is never a problem, a problem with us yeah we grapple a lot we box a lot so the the cardio the type of cardio is different from boxing you can have the best gas tank in boxing but if you go and do yeah. grappling and you never done grappling my god yeah you feeling and then if you if you fighting someone that knows what they're doing you're gonna feel like you're drowning yeah and it's not fun i can imagine yeah, yeah. It's, it's not fun i'm guessing it's just because the muscles you're working are different right because it's like if you if you have yeah, cardio saying. it's cardio but it's like anybody can run but like yeah if you have to defend takedowns or you're just getting smothered and especially because you know if you get taken out to the ground you get body triangle something it's like you can't breathe normally yeah, you can't breathe and yeah. you getting punched yeah. or elbow in the face yeah fuck that it's a long day yeah <laughs> yeah it's a long day that's why you gotta be well-rounded yeah for yeah sure. not leave room for for things like that because if not it's gonna be a long night and it's not gonna be fun fuck no you guys got any other questions? Yeah, I got one. Speaking of like being well rounded, though, I know we we've been talking about like the physical component of what it takes to be a a good, a great MMA fighter. But what is like the mental component as well? Like, I think for a lot of people that are in sports, you know, sometimes they might struggle with their mental health or like, you know, that that's a big task. Like, how are you exactly taking care of your mental health since you've been on this journey? I think everyone's different, you know. For me, that's never been a problem. We talk about it. I know what I want, and and uh, having the presence of my mom and and all the things that are important for me, having those with me, I I never lose motivation, you know. I always know what I want, and I'm not scared. But for everyone's different, you know. I know a lot of uh, friends, fighters that they work with the uh, now is becoming a lot more popular and that's something i haven't done and i'm not gonna say that's something i'm never gonna do but it's becoming a lot more popular working with the uh, sports psychologists and, and and stuff like that and i see a lot of friends that they do that and uh, they say it's very helpful and that's how they deal with all this stuff for me it's just training hard that gives me the confidence going into a fight walking walking the walk and and knowing that i did everything i have to do that's what gives me the release the relief and the confidence and and i'm good to go you know knowing that i did my rounds i had my runs i'm not gonna get tired i go in there just confident and 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 go to work go to work that that's that's what it is for me just doing the work and and the hard training you know yeah so in a way that's almost like your therapy being able to train yeah right because i can tell you have like a lot of pressure now and like you know people are expecting uh, stuff out of you whereas before you could just uh just train and fight just because it was fun to do yeah you know, train now and go like, to the league exactly yeah go to the league you know go valet some cars but now it's like <laughs> hey if 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 I start losing these fights, yeah. it's back to the link. Yeah, <laughs> no, fuck that. <laughs> you know. No, yeah, that's why I'm telling you. I always keep, I always keep in mind my goals. I wanna, I wanna make a lot of money. I wanna the things I just told you. You know, I wanna make a lot of money. I wanna, I wanna make history. Those are the things that I keep in mind, and and help me 
push through whatever it is, you know. Uh, if it is a session that I don't want to do because I'm tired or this and that, I always keep in mind, hey, I want that and this is the way I have to do this, you know. So I don't, for me, motivation, I put it on the side. Uh, I'm very disciplined. Discipline is what brought me to where I am today. And I ignore my feelings sometimes, you know. I just, I know what I have to do. And I just, I just get it done. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you see yourself five years from now? What do I see myself? He asked job interview questions. <laughs> <laughs> what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm, what do I see myself? I'm going to be 33. I'm going to be double champ in PFL, you know? Yeah, I'm going to be 145 champion and 155 champion. I'm going to be living in Lake Las Vegas in a big ass house. Yeah. Driving a nice Mercedes with my wife and uh, probably having kids by then in five, in five years. Just being at my best, being at my prime. And yeah, traveling, just fighting living a good life there you go and we still gonna be doing this podcast five hey, years from now hopefully you still have time for us of yeah course. Don't forget about it or yeah nah. we should do like ringside interviews at that point nah. yeah no nah, but by then we gotta do something different and 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 be making a barbecue it's a carne asada, <laughs> or asada. Something, you know yeah for sure something a little bit different but nah, definitely we're gonna be here uh Hopefully you guys keep growing. I like what you guys are doing. Thank this you. is this is pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh it's been it's been it's been good having a talk with you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving us your time and for all the people that might not know where they can find you, can you share uh how they can get in contact with you social media? Yeah, uh you guys can find me on Instagram, uh Brian Surcher. It's a little bit weird El Brian. spelling. B R A H Y A N, Zercher, my last name with the Z, Zercher. You guys can find me on uh, on Instagram and YouTube and you know all the social media. For sure, and stay uh, stay updated. Follow him so you know when the next fight's gonna be. Unfortunately, as we were talking about earlier, the last fight got canceled. But um, I guess we don't have a date set, so we won't we won't say it on camera. But hopefully, you'll get a fight before the end of the year. Yeah, I think it's for sure that we're gonna we're gonna get one more fight before the end of the year, and next year is gonna be is gonna be a very exciting year for me. You know, uh, as I mean, not not a lot of people knows PFL. PFL is one of the biggest organizations in the world besides UFC and all those companies. And what PFL does is a different format. Yep. So every year they have a tournament in every weight class. Mm -hmm. And so they have 10 guys. They start the season in April. So you have 10 guys and just like a regular tournament, you have a um, regular season. So you have two fights in regular season. You need to make points to go to the playoffs. You find the semifinals and then you go to the final. So you, you have a, a total of four fights in eight months. If you win those four fights, you become the champion and you win a million dollars. Yep. And this is an opportunity that I've been begging for and that I've been working for and and now it's finally happening. So next year I'm going to be in the season. It's going to be my first time in the season. And uh, the only thing I can warrant is that I'm going to give my all to try to become the champion next year and and and, and win that million dollars. So next year you're going to be a millionaire. Yeah. Nice. I'm about to apply too. Chama. Don't tell me it's too late. He's a, he's yeah, a, I'm about to apply too for a million. Got that side on you. Yeah. yeah, I got you guys. <laughs> so for you, first training tomorrow. We, oh, we, shit. We, we're doing sparring. We're no, doing wait, sparring wait tomorrow. Wait till Saturday. You got to go up to Mount Charleston yeah. and run them yeah. seven oh, miles. That's man. even worse. Yeah. I yeah. fucking hate that <laughs> run, bro. It's crazy. Yeah. But uh, yeah, stay up to date, man. Follow our pages because we were talking about it off camera. If it is where you said in November, I feel like we'll pull up. Yeah, we pull, we'll up. pull up. I don't we'll know pull where up. it is, but we we'll pull, pull up, up for we'll sure. Fuck up. yeah. Yeah. Let them know where yeah. they can find you guys on social media. Oh, you guys could get me on Instagram at Ocho Benji. 
Uh, y'all can follow me all platforms at n the number two d a t k. Uh, follow my personal Instagram is going to be at akbtg. Follow the podcast page on the run pod. Um, go follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Uh, thank you guys so much for all the support. We'll see you guys next week for another episode, man. Peace. Peace. Saludos a toda la raza.